Great. All right. Well, welcome everybody and welcome uh, the legendary uh, Cynthia Enloe, who I'm delighted to uh, join us today with uh, one of my students, Roy Sin. Uh, and Roy Sin and I, well, she's in a, a class of mine where we're discussing the international politics of the everyday. And uh, Cynthia, your work has uh, been an important part of our conversation. It's certainly work that helped shape my own thinking as a, as a student and in, in what you could do uh, in political science and international relations. Uh, but this session is really student-led. So uh, I might have a few questions, you know, take the opportunity uh, to ask you some questions myself. But I want to I want to start with the questions that uh, the students in my class have posed for you. And I, I've shared you, uh, I've sent these questions to you um, in advance. I've got, uh, I guess, four. Uh, the first one is a double question. And it is, in a recent interview, you said that militarization is unlikely to ever benefit women because it empowers men and diverts resources away from areas that benefit women. Is there an instance where it might and could you and could declining marriage rates impact that? And the, the rationale behind that uh, second question is because of women's dependence on male breadwinners and husbands who would then die uh, in, in military conflict. Well, I love this question. So thank you very much to the student who posed it because putting together militarism, women's lives, gender inequality, and marriage is really smart. And I wish everybody who thought about military personnel um, would think about marriage gender inequality, and how women calculate any of those. Here's, here's my sense of what I've learned so far. I mean, we're all learning, right? So this isn't the end of the conversation. This is, well, it's kind of the middle of the conversation. And that is, first of all, there are a lot of women around the world, especially today, because so many governments have stopped compulsory military service for men. I mean, Turkey still has a compulsory conscription. So does um, Russia. So does South Korea. But lots of countries that used to have compulsory male conscription, which meant they could fulfill their ranks, the military ranks, um, by compulsory service of men, young men especially. Now that so many governments have dropped compulsory service, the UK has dropped it, Ireland has dropped it, Canada has dropped it, the Netherlands has dropped it, China has dropped it, Japan has dropped it, most governments around the world have dropped it. Some have just recently added it, which is interesting. Um, that is Sweden and Norway, and that's a very deep gender discussion we could have if you want as to why those seemingly women's rights oriented state legislatures recently added women and men as having compulsory service. So, a lot of governments want women to serve. They don't want too many because the whole attraction of the military to most men is to prove their manhood, especially men who are 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, who are still in the midst of figuring out who they are and serving as a soldier in the state's military can help them, not all men, but a lot of young men, um, and so they don't want too many women because then being a soldier would be like being a bank teller, which in most societies now is more women than men. So they need women, but not too many. For And not too many means anywhere between 10 and 16%. Not 20, definitely not 30. Um. And in Israel, where there is compulsory service for women and men, it has been very 
um, contested as to what women can do in the Israeli military and which women amongst the Jewish Israelis should serve. That is, particularly um, Ashkenazi young women serve. A lot of the um, Sephardic Jewish women in Israel get excused, oftentimes because they marry early. So think of all those moving parts, right? Whenever you think of any military you're interested, any military. For those women, young women, who are attracted to not quote unquote non-traditional jobs, that is jobs that usually women don't take up or aren't hired for, the military today can seem quite attractive. I've heard women, young women, say it allows them to put off marriage. See, there comes marriage. It doesn't mean they don't want to marry or never will marry, but it means there's something they can do that they can justify putting off marriage so that their mothers and fathers don't rag them to get married. It also gets away from home and especially from small towns. So you always have to do geography here. Military service and urban men and women and military service and rural men and women are really different. And for a lot of women and men, serving in the military means you get to leave home and to leave the small town that you find kind of cramping. The third thing is that you earn an income not a great income, but an income and with some benefits. And the biggest benefit, if the government offers it, is that you get some help later on to go to university. And that is so expensive in so many countries that that's a big deal. So marriage for women um, and marry, being married to a male soldier can seem attractive because you kind of get secondhand patriotism bonus points. Um, you get free housing, may not be very good housing, but in many countries, free housing is no small thing and you get healthcare benefits. You may even get childcare, maybe. So being married to a male soldier as a young woman, may seem as though it's got some marriage benefits until your husband's wounded. And then you are the main caretaker of your husband, even if they're veterans health services. And as this very good student questioner said, you also risk, it depends if you're, it depends if the country's military, your husband, is joining is at war. So the Chinese military now isn't a huge military and it isn't at war. Before 2014, the Russian military was, well, it did have wars, but it didn't have major wars. But starting with 2014 and the Putin policy of backing the invasion of Eastern Ukraine, and then after February, 2022, a full onslaught of Ukraine means that the calculation that a woman made about marrying a soldier in say 2010 and risking becoming the caretaker of a wounded man or the widow of a killed soldier has really changed. So you, whenever you look at this really wonderfully knotted question you've asked, be very clear about the country and what their military politics are, including do they have compulsory male service or female service. Look at whether their benefits that the government offers to not just husbands, but to wives. Look at the veterans services and are they as 
good as the government may claim it to be. So for instance, in today's New York Times, so this is now February 26th, there is an article by a very good New York Times reporter who covers Russian politics. Her name is Valerie Hopkins. I'm a big fan of really good investigatory journalists who write for very reputable, carefully edited newspapers. And Valerie Hopkins in February 26th, New York Times, has an article about Russian women who don't know whether they're male husband Russian soldiers are dead or not. And she, Valerie Hopkins, has been doing very good reporting about this. And there are very good reporters covering the lives of women married to Ukrainian male soldiers as well. So great question, but think of it as several moving parts. And you know this from taking Professor Barron's courses. Take the parts apart marriage, women, men, age, class, rural, urban, patriotism, skeptical of patriotism, at war, not at war. Take all those moving parts, keep your eye on each of them, and then watch whether any military service or marriage to somebody in military service is good for women. That's an exceptional answer, uh, Cynthia. Thank you very much. The we have the the following. The next two questions are of a different different track, and uh, I have some follow ups that build on those. But I thought before we move on to that, uh, I don't know if Royson, if you wanted to follow up with. Yeah, I was hoping to jump in because I have quite a few questions that are very related to um, like to that. Um, sure. So at the moment, I think there's. Um, a lot of talk, and I wonder whether this is kind of related to Norway and Sweden that you were talking about. There's a lot of talk about, like, you know, a crisis of masculinity or lots of, like, unconventional relationships and just notions of, like, feminine and masculine are becoming just very different. Um, and, you know, like, there's just more conversations around that. How do you think that can be, like, applied to your theory, I suppose, on, like, militarization? And, um, All right. Well, I think, Royson, the quote, cri this is an idea now, the crisis of masculinity. And again, you have to pick which country. Are we talking about Samoa? Or are we talking about the UK, right? Because it's not true everywhere. So pick your country. So let's say we're talking about UK. I think um, in many ways, crisis of masculinity is... Um... Uh, goes beyond countries in a sense with social media and things that it's kind of like a western social media sort of like international but maybe not but you have to actually ask mm. i mean is there a crisis of masculinity because that talks about very general it's not just your brother's having a hard time or your boyfriend's mm. completely upset with it and trying to build muscles and whatever um it's that it's general and so while social media plays a part, there's a lot, a lot of queer and gay and gender fluidity in social media that can be very supportive of young men and not so young men who want to think differently about being boys or men. So yeah, you, you have to investigate it rather than claim it. Now, the people who claim it have an agenda. That's something to keep in mind. It's not me sitting here in, you know, my favorite easy chair and kind of thinking about it. It's who says, you know, in our country, whichever our country is, there's a crisis of masculinity. So Modi's party that's in power in India definitely has a stake in claiming a crisis of masculinity. It fits with their governing agenda. 
Republicans in the United States, many of them anyway, you know, even all Republicans aren't the same, have a claim that backs up their political party agenda. And so do many Tories in the UK. Because if you can claim, if you can claim, because a crisis means there's worry, there's danger, there's a sense of anxiety, just fluidity of masculinity, meaning there are many different ways to be a boy and there are very many ways to be a man. And, you know, my brother very deliberately didn't go into the army when there was compulsory service here. He deliberately chose the Coast Guard, right? He wasn't having a crisis of masculinity. He wanted to be on boats and he didn't want to be in war. He wanted to take care of safety in harbors, right? He wasn't having a crisis of masculinity. He just wasn't very interested in proving that he was a guy by shooting people. You know, he still had a uniform. He had to do his service. But so we should watch about who is claiming that there is a crisis of masculinity. And Rosen, I think for many military recruiters where there's volunteer military service, that'd be the UK, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, the US, the Netherlands, Germany, Italy, for military recruiters, the idea of the crisis of masculinity is God's gift. Because they have on a platter how you, 17-year-old boy, if you're nervous about whether you are, can prove you're a real man and your father calls you a wimp because you won't, I don't know, go hunting with him or whatever, or you don't like to go to the, you know, Arsenal football matches, you know, whatever it is that your father is upset about. You can join the military and there will be no question in anybody's mind about your manhood. That's the great gift that military recruiters try to offer. Now, in the United States today, the military recruiters for the Army, for the Navy, and I watch the three services, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, they can't sell the quotas. The Republicans, or the let's call it conserv social conservatives in the United States, talk a lot about a crisis of masculinity. But obviously, a lot of 18-year-old boys aren't feeling it because the military recruiters have this formula that they're offering, and not enough young men are taking it up. Clearly, they can get a construction job, or they can go into a training program for plumbers, or even through some nepotism, perhaps, get into a financial services and they think well I can you know I'm a guy you know I deal in stocks and bonds you know nobody can question my masculinity I don't have to go into the army so I think the crisis of masculinity should always be put in quotes ask who has a stake in claiming that there is one which young men not so young men and older men, always watch the generations, of which races and ethnicities in the country you're interested in actually feel as though they're in a crisis and which actually don't care, don't feel any anxiety. And then watch what the military recruiters do with it. It's a really interesting question. Watch parties in power, watch parties vying for power and see if they take it up. Which social movements take it up, right? Yeah. Which social movements just never talk about it at all? It'd be a great, I love dreaming up things for other people to investigate. It'd be a great thing to investigate, honestly.
do you think that that can be kind of mapped onto um with Sweden and Norway that you're saying that um ah. like do you think that because a lot of crisis of masculinity sort of like notions seem to be with very sort of progressive movements perhaps sometimes I know yeah. you're saying Republicans but I think the it is the same sort of thing is still brought up I think in I don't know I don't wow know. Norway and Sweden this is all about Putin this is all about a increasingly, not everybody, because I have a lot of feminist friends in Norway and Sweden and Finland who are very, very um, worried, not excited, worried about the rising popular fear of the Putin regime's potential for assault. And that's what drove the nor I mean this is very and it's very interesting to go look at look at the Norwegian this would be 19 this would be 2000 Roslyn I may have the date a bit wrong this may be around 2019 I'm trying to think about that it's it's not in the last year and two years um and I um look at the Norwegian legislative debate and my Norwegian feminist friends said, my God, there was no debate. How did this get through? Norwegian feminists have never called, never called for gender equality to take the form of women and men being compulsory in their service. Never. So they said, don't claim this is some kind of gender equality move. It's not our gender equality move. It's people who want to build people in the legislature who want to build up the Norwegian military, they're tacking it on to gender equality. It wasn't our idea. And Swedish feminists say the same. And in Sweden, my S Swedish feminist scholar friends, I have a friend who's looking at this. It's really good. She's doing her dissertation on it. She says, oh, so Sweden has compulsory military service. They were talking about young, of course, young Swedish men and young Swedish women. That's new. But she said, look how it's implemented. A much wider band, and not really that wide because it's Sweden, but wider, a much wider band of young Swedish men are being called upon to do compulsory service many fewer percentage-wise of their cohort of Swedish young women are being drafted. So the implementation is not the same. And, and my colleague friend in Stockholm is tracking it, which is what you do, right? So I think this you're great to bring up the Swedish and Norwegian current processes of filling the ranks and the ranks are getting bigger because of the fear of the Putin aggression. Um, but that doesn't mean it's being done in exactly the same way. But it is really interesting. And as I say, Swedish and Norwegian feminists are alarmed that anybody claimed this was gender equality. Their notion of gender equality is nobody should have to do military compulsory service. Great, great double question. I want to uh, just follow up on this because I think one of the things that's, at least for me, it's always characterized and been inspiring by your work is there's people there. I mean, when I was, you know, first studying uh, international relations as an undergraduate and, uh, you know, reading a lot of IR theories of postgraduate, there's no people in any of it. You yeah, know, I know. It was, I mean, I think it's changing, you know, it's changed to an extent now, but it certainly wasn't always the case. And still today, you're going to find, you know, the big kind of main, you know, IR security stuff. Whatever. Anything called theory. <laughs> well, well I, yeah or anybody who aspires to be called a theorist if you want to aspire to be an international relations theorist yes uh there's no people in any of it and we so the the second two questions i have which i'll get to in a minute uh, i'm going to sort of sort of jump in front of them is uh, how you know 
it's a question about locating and designing your work, right? I mean, you know, how do you how do you go about engaging in a research design within you know politics, political science, IR, whatever you want to call it? I don't care, um, but it's clearly political and it's often clearly international. You know, what are the steps that you take in building up you know a, a research plan and uh, what what do you take inspiration from? when in, in that in, in do in, in that process? I think I think one of the first things on that I really well I have a lucky career path. I started okay, don't tell anybody. I didn't start as an IR person. I started as a comparative politics person. Especially Southeast Asia. And the country that I supposedly was trying to understand was the country of Malaysia. Right? Well, you can't do well. I guess you can. You can. You can always erase people, but it's really much harder to erase people. All kinds of people in different demographics. Um, when you're trying to understand a particular country, I mean, it would mean I would try to understand Malaysia, and not take into account that ethnic Malays, this is before I had any gender curiosity. So I was, I was kind of stupid, but you know, I wasn't, I wasn't totally stupid, but I was, you know, I was, I was a little dumb. Anyway, so I was looking, I, if you study Malaysia, well, this is also true of Indonesia and it's true of Britain and it, but especially if you're studying Malaysia, everything's about ethnic politics. There's class within the, Chinese community. There's class differences within the Indian Malaysian community, and there's class politics within the Malay community. But you really had to ask, and I was very conscious when I was interviewing people. I was doing state education policy. Very, very, very touchy. Very. It, when I was doing it. Well, still. And there I always knew if I was talking to a Malay or an Indian or a Chinese. I could never kid myself that somebody in the teachers union was just a teacher. If it was a Chinese teacher, I knew that they had a really different set of worries and goals than if they were a Malay teacher. So I think I was lucky, Baron, because I, Alan, because I, um, I started out as comparative politics person. So I was never, I was never in love with the idea of the capital S state. I, ne I thought it was a complete delusion since I knew how complicated states were. I knew how complicated the Belgian state was. I knew how complicated the Cambodian state was. Oh my God. So I would never say the Cambodian state had an international interest. Ever. That just sounded crazy to me. It sounded naive, actually. So what what would you say then in, you know, when someone does talk about, you know, the I mean, you mentioned Putin and what's happening in yeah. in, you know, Norway and Sweden. I mean, these are, there's obviously an extent to which, you know, people are fearful, but also an extent to which whatever the state is, is also responding in, you know, various ways. The state, isn't, the state isn't responding. Okay. It's particular legislators and particularly senior civil servants and cabinet members, which are three different things, mm -hmm. you know, um, are responding to their own assessment of their own fears. So I, I love that. Sorry, I love that. That's brilliant. That's a great answer because it actually leads very closely into question three. But I, I realize I interrupted you. No, 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 no. We're all. This is a conversation. You have to interrupt <laughs> the, each other. The, the other question yeah. from from my uh, students in this uh, in this undergraduate class is in, and it deals with how particular constituencies within a part of the state right respond to something. And the question they had was a response to what you wrote in 
uh, you know, your book, Bananas, Beaches, and Bases, where you discuss the use of prostitutes by U.S. soldiers. And they were curious if there was ever any pushback from the defense establishment in response. This is a great question. I love this question. Because here's the funny thing. I had three responses. And this shows that the thing called the defense establishment is much more internally dynamic. So the first, I, get, I was asked to give a talk by a guy that I really respect, um, Ed Dorn, Edwin Dorn, D-O-R-N. And he was an African-American, is still an African-American um, advo rights advocate. And he was independent of the government. He was in a NGO, but Clinton really respected his work. And so I think it was Clinton. Clinton asked him if he would come into the Defense Department and be, I think, the Undersecretary for Personnel, which is a big job. But it was really inspired by Clinton to bring an African-American civil rights advocate who thought about the military a lot, Ed thought about the military a lot, into the Defense Department. The establishment. But Ed was still a African-American advocate. And African-American NGOs like NAACP and others, and Ed's small um, advocacy group too, they have been watching the promotion rates of whites and African-Americans inside the US military over decades. They watch promotion rates, they watch dishonorable discharge rates. Because, you know, if you are dishonorably, and that's a very official category, if you are dishonorably discharged, you can't get a job out in the civilian world. So it's a huge thing to, and they w watched are proportionately African-Americans, especially men, more likely to be dishonorably discharged from the military being accused of something than their white colleagues. So again, the military is very dynamic around race and age. And, and so when Ed came in to Clinton's defense establishment, under Secretary of Defense for personnel, he, because he and I had worked on things together, he asked me, Roseanne, you'd especially appreciate, what would you do? Ed, part of the defense establishment, civilian, civilian, of course, in Washington, asked me to come to a big conference that he was organizing to speak. And I thought, I am not going to speak at a Pentagon conference. Right? I, I'm just not. And Ed said, oh, come on. We need your perspective, you know. I mean, he's a really good guy, and I really liked him. It wasn't that. It was just, oh, my God. And so he said, look, you can speak about anything you want to. And it was a big conference of military recruiters and social scientists who advise military recruiters. What do 17-year-old boys in Kansas care about? That kind of social scientist. So I said, well, Ed, you have to now, you won't kind of limit what I'm going to talk about. He said, no, honest, I'm not, I, whatever you want to talk about. And I thought, well, okay, this is a chance. So I decided to talk to this room of, I don't know, 250 civilian and uniformed U.S. defense professionals who care about filling recruiting quotas. And I decided to talk about prostitution. And I started out, I mean, you know, it's just, like any of us who are teachers, you know, you know when 
the Roma is going to be skeptical. Like, what in the, what in the hell? Who is this short woman up on stage who's going to talk to all of us? And I said, look, I know you don't usually, all of you, 200 and whatever, I know you don't really talk out loud and you don't talk officially about prostitution, but I know you all deal with it. And I know you all think about it. And I think a lot of you actually make policies around it. So I said, just for this moment, meaning this hour, let's talk about prostitution around especially US bases especially U.S. overseas bases. Let's talk about how you talk to young people about it if they ask, how you don't talk about it deliberately, how you think about it. So we had that conversation. So here's the first response, Ilan. It was a rainy day, I remember this. And this was at a military academy where they had a big hall. That's where the conference was being held. So we had a coffee break after my thing. And I was standing at the door looking out at the rain because nobody could go out. And one after another, women officers and male officers came up to have a little private whispered conversation. Whispered. And they came up, and really, we were kind of talking like this, both pretending we were looking out at the rain. And each one of the women and men who came up were officers who had been officers who were kind of the number two running a military base. And each of them said, I know. I don't, I've never known that this is them talking. I never known what to do. I'm supposed to make the base run smoothly. I'm supposed to keep up soldiers or sailors, young, morale. I'm supposed to make sure that local laws aren't broken. I'm supposed to make sure that fights don't break out in the bars around the bases. So I, I know a lot about prostitution. And to tell you the truth, I just tried to keep things calm. I don't feel good about it. I don't know what to do about it. That's the first, right? The second, so there were several, lots of people in the room. And about two months later, I got an email from a group of chaplains, military chaplains, Navy chaplains. And chaplains are very interesting to look at. And they are quite different from each other. Some are quite conservative socially. Some are really human rights activists in their own religious practice, you know. Anyway, and these chaplains, some of whom actually were quite conservative, wants me to come down to a Navy base in Rhode Island and have lunch with them and just talk about the dilemmas they face about whether they're complicit in prostitution or not and what is prostitution and who are women who are prostitutes. What are their lives like? That was the second. So that was very interesting. I hadn't really thought enough about military chaplains. You know, military chaplain is an oxymoron, you know. So they're living the oxymoron life. And then, and this is all a result of Ed asking me to do this talk. And so this is the third response. The third response was from a group of Navy women, again, Navy, maybe, well, maybe they had a connection, I don't know. Navy women officers who had an informal lunch, who, the, Navy women officers who were stationed in the Pentagon. 
I mean, that they were doing their tour of admin work. And they asked me to come down to Washington and have lunch with them in their monthly lunch of women Navy officers. So this isn't rank and file. And this means these are women who for the most part are trying to make a career. And at some point, they will be the deputy commander of some Navy base. And if you're the deputy commander of a base, you are expected to manage prostitution. That's one of the things I learned. Not the commander, the deputy commander. And if you don't get a good review, it will hurt your chances for your promotion. And these women, they were great. I mean, they really just wanted to have a... They said, we never talk about this. Or we do with our bunkmate. But we don't have a general... We've never... This is the first time... This lunch is the first time we've ever talked in a group of 12 or more. We never talk about... It. We don't talk about who these women are. We don't talk about their lives. We don't talk about the danger they're in. We don't talk about sexual exploitation. Mainly what we talk about is not being confused as a prostitute. So when we put on our civilian clothes and we're on leave, we don't want to be taken for a prostitute. That's mainly what we think about, is not being confused with them. We don't think about them. We just think about our own dignity and our own safety. At the senior level, the capital E establishment. So that's all military personnel at not the rank and file, right? Chaplains, career making, women officers, and much higher but still not at the top top officers who came and talked to me in the rain. So what I would say a lot is that to this, well, and to this wonderful student who asked this good question, first of all, keep asking the question about every single military you're interested in, every military, every military, every military has a prostitution policy. Every single one. And they have policies for around their domestic local bases in the UK. And they have policies when their troops are sent abroad. And they get very worried if wives hear about it. At the very, very senior level, the Minister of, De of Defense you know, the MOD, top, top, top person, or the commander-in-chief, uniformed, you know. They don't, they try not to talk about it. The main thing is ignore it. Push it, push, push the implementation and the policy further down, make it pretty invisible, because you don't want the general public to realize you have a prostitution policy. You have to keep the general public thinking that you're a moral, patriotic institution. So you try to keep the policy decisions way pushed down. And you try to take the implementation, you push it down. So it's not visible to the public. And it usually isn't. That's mm -hmm. how they do. It's really interesting how, yeah, I suspect this is not what you know my students were anticipating um but it's really interesting to to hear how these uh you know these per these you know very personal experiences right and these kind of mundane sort of problems uh are and you know you know speak to questions of you know the of national security in ways that you might not necessarily think and it, i you know it's I think a testament to what you're saying, you know, a few minutes ago about there is no state, right? You have all these different peoples and different levels and different organizations, and they're all doing their own thing. And, and you know, trying to speak coherently about it as a whole is, you know, very, very difficult. I've got uh, 
one of the other questions, so a little bit about this class, I'll uh, just a little bit of background and then I'll get to the, the third question from the class. So this is the uh, a final year undergraduate module on the international politics of the everyday. It's I actually- love, <laughs> I love it's, that course. You love that I wish everybody course. could take that course. <laughs> It's it's actually a um, it's it's actually a theory class, and the way I, I the, the the idea behind it was, you know, I don't think the majority of my students are really interested in getting into you know really really close readings of a single text over a period of a month, right? Number one, we don't really teach like that in the UK, even though it was my experience in undergrad. And number two, as much as I enjoy that activity, it can also get a bit stale and sometimes a little bit boring, especially in a politics class where you know a lot of students don't aren't really interested in that kind of exegesis or that kind of activity. I thought, well, how can I, how can we actually, you know, bring into a class all these abstractions and theoretical concepts in a way that's interesting? And well, why don't we see about the different ways in which people experience the international? And then we can play with these different concepts. And as a consequence of setting up the class with a very similar kind of, um, sort of a very similar introduction start of the year, there was always this contrast, right? Between, you know, what, I suspect most of my students are encountering in international relations uh, theory because we will have students studying international relations as an undergraduate degree and you know what the kind of stuff we're doing and how it's still international or global or you know whatever you want to call it and i i suspect that's a little bit of the background behind this other question uh from the class which is did you receive any academic resistance within the international uh. relations research community when you first start directing your research toward individual relationships. And I, I'm pretty sure that you've spoken about this in a related question in the past, um, but I know they'll love it's to- always interesting to think about. Yeah. But you know what? So this is a very good question that this student has thought of because it's really interesting. It's about patriarchy. And how does patriarchy work? Which you could ask the same thing about racism and how does racism work? And it works, works like gears work, right? And one of the things I've learned to answer this really good question is a lot of resistance is invisible. It's not that you give a paper at, oh, just later, <laughs> sorry. Um, it's not that you give a paper, you know, that's what academics do, as Elon knows. You give paper and somebody stands up and humiliates you in the room by saying, Professor Enlo, you know that, of course, that's totally naive. You know that's not how power works. What are you trying to do? This is really wasteful and foolish, okay? That's not what people do. You have a panel of four, this is one of the ways patriarchy works and racism, depending on which the, where the, the motivation for resistance is coming from. You have a, a panel, Elon's been on many of these. You've been, you're on a panel, there are four papers, uh, there's a discussant, there's a chair. This is the ritual at an academic meeting. Four people give four papers on something they've found, and you are maybe the only one who asks feminist questions about war. Here's how fake patriarchy works. Nobody asks about your findings. There are 55 people in the room the other three people who present get a lot of questions. People are really engaged with, I don't know, weapons expenses and the use of drones and I don't know, something else. Territorial occupation with no gender analysis, those three. You can have gender analysis for all three, but they don't. So here's the way patriarchy works is that nobody tr treats your feminist investigation of the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian military as interesting. You just get no questions. Now that doesn't happen to me because 
so many of the audiences I speak to are there because they're really interested in gender analysis. But that is how it works. So the pushback is, I mean, it can be humiliating. I mean, certainly. But oftentimes it is silence, dismissal, as if you hadn't even said anything. All right? And that is really hard to deal with. And then you have to, well, that's one of the reasons why in so many academic associations, the historical society, the sociological society, the international relations, BISA, British International Studies Association, the ISA, which is US-based, that's why they all have women's caucuses. If you, if your work is treated as if it's not serious, then you have to create amongst yourselves a maybe small to begin with and gets bigger and bigger because of course it's a, one of the smartest groups, really. You start and you create a group of 20 of you who really do find these sorts of investigations, gender smart, gender curious investigations, interesting. And you start the women's caucus or you start a section that is, so for instance, in the, in the, in Biza, um, there's Gerwig, I guess. Yeah. And in, um, the ISA, it's the feminist theory, feminists, FTGS, feminist theory and gender section. And it's now 400 people. But when we started it, Remember, you start it because your work is not being taken seriously. So you try to bring together people who are interested seriously. And you start with 15 of you. And the next year, there are 35 of you. And 15 years later, there are 400 of you. And you're the most exciting section in the ISA. Everybody wants to come to your section panels because they're so lively and they're so collegial. Nobody, nobody humiliates anybody at a feminist section. Nobody. They can ask pushy questions. That's, that's fine. But that is how patriarchy and racism works. They treat your investigations around the working of racisms, plural, and the workings of patriarchy and misogyny, they treat it as if it doesn't matter. And they hope you will go away. But you don't go away. You organize. And you show, you have to show why it is so interesting to ask these questions. What you do discover for instance, how difficult it is to get women to stay married to male soldiers. The divorce rates are really high. And, the, and that's a national security issue, by the way. And the, the defense establishments in every country do not want to admit it. They never let out the divorce rate data. But you show that what you're doing is serious. I wrote a whole book called Seriously because I got so interested in the politics of who takes who seriously and who doesn't take whom seriously. And that seriously is always like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder and who gets to wield it. Um, I... I really appreciate that response. Like so many of my questions that I have about your work are very much to do with like exactly what you've just been speaking about. Um, but I think for me, the what I'm most interested in is you're talking that you said about uh, that is about like creating these like women's caucuses and being able to have those discussions with people and the groups get bigger and bigger. 
for me, the big jump seems to be getting people to care from the very like get go in the sense of um, like um, with theory and then like, you know, yeah, international theory versus more applied theory like your own. Um, it kind of seems like it's only like I think I care about your theory and applied theory because of my position as a woman and someone who understands the importance of applied theory because like it matters to my own life how do you get people who don't have those sort of standpoints to to care basically and like how do you get like how do you integrate women's caucuses and whatnot into the mainstream rather than being separate as a women's caucus yeah well first of all a caucus is part of an organization so the first thing make sure that you are part of things right but the other thing is that a feminist gender analysis is not just a gender analysis it's a feminist informed gender analysis and that means you care about unequal power if you just did a gender analysis you would care and i care about masculinities plural femininities plural and how they interact in political life, all kinds of political life, voting and unions and parties and everything. If you do a feminist informed gender analysis, you care about how power is used and power is affected in the workings of femininities and masculinities. Rewards, punishments, lures, and that means that anybody who has any stake, including worries, but also aspirations, in either plural masculinities or plural femininities, how they're policed, how they're rewarded some, the basis for resistance becomes interesting. And that's why there are a number of, not in the caucus, because that's really specifically for women and non-binary trying to get ahead in the ISA or in BISA. But the section where we present papers and findings and make each other interested and help each other get published and get jobs and all that. Um, that's about masculinities as well. So for instance, in this new book, shall I do a show and tell? Where is yes, it? definitely. Oh, yeah, here's a show and tell. So this is the newest book, just came out in London. This And this book, I really, as you can see, it's not huge. It's digestible. And it's about all kinds of wars, including the current wars, which we're all dealing with, including the wars we don't pay any attention to that are killing people right now, as in Sudan, all right? Sudan isn't on the front page of anything. But this, I really, when I thought about 12 feminist lessons of war, here's, so I had to dream them up, you know, and why did I pick 12 anyway? But that's anyway. I like the word 12 in English. That's why, you know, 12 days of Christmas or something. Anyway, 12 is nice. And you have to have a finite number. I mean, you can't say 35 feminist <laughs> lessons of war. Nobody will pick it up, right? And you can't say three because that, I mean, there's always more than three of anything. Anyway, but as I was trying to think, well, what? And so each chapter is a lesson. And it's not a lesson that I've dreamed up by myself. It's a lesson I've been taught by feminists around the world. Serbian feminists and Russian feminists, Ukrainian feminists, for sure. Israeli feminists, Japanese feminists. I've been taught by so many feminists around the world about the workings of militarism and war. And one of the things that I have been taught, and I called this chapter, getting, chapter three, getting men to fight isn't so easy. 
because I think a lot of this reminds me keep this away. Um, one of the myths out there is that all men want to be soldiers. Well, actually, they don't. That's why there is forced conscription. That's why even with non-forced conscription, recruiters can't fill their ranks. Actually, it is a very narrow and naive notion of masculinity, first of all, to make it singular, and second of all, to imagine that all forms of masculinity align perfectly with militarism. They don't. And you can look at what lengths governments go to to try and fill their ranks to explode the myth that there's only one kind of masculinity and that kind of masculinity matches perfectly with militarism. So that chapter is saying, well, one of the lessons that feminists have taught us, because feminists are very interested in masculinities, is that actually militaries work really hard and impose really stringent punishments in order to squeeze men, especially young men, into the very, very tight-fitting boot of militarism. So I think for you, Roseanne, the, it's to make clear that as a feminist, as a feminist gender specialist, of course you take women's lives seriously. That you can't understand any kind of politics, and certainly not international politics, if you don't take women's lives seriously. But to take women's lives seriously means that you interrogate the politics of masculinity. I think I really screwed up by not having a gender section of my PhD. <laughs> this thing to well, understand. didn't we all? I didn't either. You know. No, no I just, I... You know, but we learn. We, we learn. learn. It's, it's not and... that you don't make mistakes. That <laughs> I don't make mistakes is that we realize that we made a mistake. That that is, and we admit it. Yes. So other people won't. Yes. Uh... Very, very true. And, you know, it also occurred to me at the number 12, uh, a very significant number, you know, not just the calendar, but, you know, the 12 tribes, a ancient Israel is divided into 12. Yes. Tribes. There's a lot of significance, number 12. Is definitely... I don't know why, but 12 yeah. in humankind, there's something about 12, not to mention the dozen and, you know, whatever. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, anyway, I had, I had to pick some finite yeah. number so that I wouldn't write too long a book, but <laughs> also so that the book wouldn't seem undigestible. I mean, yeah, it's no. a trade, it's a trade book. It's not just an academic book. Well, it's a very good choice of a uh, very good numerical choice. Um, we've taken up you know a lot of your time. I yeah, really, so wanted, maybe. I really, really like to thank you for engage, you know answering my students' questions and uh, spending time talking with us. And it's just been a real a real privilege to to have this opportunity with you. Thank you so much. Well, it's a pleasure, and I want to say hi to everybody in Durham and Roseanne. Keep me posted. So. Ilan has my email. You know, I just have one email. I don't have secret emails. Um, and kind of tell me how it goes when you start trying to get people together. Sometimes it's just having coffee together. And sometimes it's having a book group together. You know, six of you. Once every two months, so it's not too burdensome. All right? Excellent. And and start book groups, you know, almost every revolution started with a book group. <laughs> that's that's probably true. Yeah. I um, just, sorry, Roisin, go ahead. I was just gonna echo what you said before that it's just I like it's been I feel like this conversation has really helped me with going forward. And it's just been an incredible privilege to be able to speak to you. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. I mean, you're the one taking the time and the thought and so but keep me posted, you know teeny little steps forward are forward yeah all right well thank you again we need you. take care alan this is all great right. and hi to all your students they're going to make us smarter <laughs> brilliant on that note um i'll uh stop the recording